Hi everyone, welcome to Life is a Social Game, Lessons Learned Bringing the Sims to Facebook. My name is Ray Mazza, and this is a narration of my slides from my talk at the Game Developers Conference in 2012. I'm a creative director with EA Playfish. I'm their lead designer across all Playfish studios, and I've spent nine years working on Sims games, and have been lead designer on the more recent ones. So I have worked on a few Sims games. This is a subset. But then one year ago, I switched over to social gaming when I started working on The Sims Social. And this was completely new territory for me, and it's why I'm really excited to share my perspectives with you all today. Quick disclaimer, just in case I say something outlandish, my views and those contained in these slides are entirely personal and do not represent those of my employer. And you don't need to take notes, these slides are available on my website, and I'll give you a link at the end of the talk. Great, now, before we get started, I have a personal mission to share. As a newcomer to free-to-play games, I was stepping into a space that hadn't really captured me yet, despite having tried plenty of those games. So when I joined the space, I did so with the mindset that I wanted to make free-to-play games that appealed to their existing mass market, which is really important, but that also converted players such as myself by adding more depth and creative gameplay. My journey over the past year has been to see if that's possible. Now, I'll start the talk with a quick introduction to The Sims Social, and then I'll share seven discrete lessons about designing in the social space, some of which also apply to core gaming. And then we'll spend the second half of the talk really digging into relationships and social interaction, and we'll see some of the interesting effects these things have on players. Then I'll wrap up by asking where social gaming might go next. And throughout the talk, I'll also be stepping out onto a limb and making three bold claims about the social space. The Sims brand has been around for 12 years and it's evolved in countless ways. And in that time, we've sold over 140 million copies of Sims games. But then The Sims Social comes along, and in only six months, it has had over 70 million unique players. It looks very much like the first Sims game, but the gameplay is fitted to the social space and you can play with your friends. Now, for those of you who haven't seen it or played it, it's an energy-based, asynchronous, home-building game. You make money through building skills and completing quests, and if you're in a good mood while you do that, then you earn extra money to spend on decorating your house. And you can form relationships with your friend sims and help each other out around your respective homes. It's also won a handful of awards. And according to Raptor, Sim Social was the most played social game of 2011 when looking at respective launch week and launch month data. So it's done well. But we all need to evolve. We're at a critical point in social gaming where mechanics and themes are becoming overused. Players may be catching on. The social gaming audience hasn't been keeping up with Facebook. Last year, Facebook grew 30%, but the social gaming audience only grew 11%. No game has been as successful as City Bell, and that was released nearly a year and a half ago, which is practically three generations of social gaming. Going forward, a greater focus on differentiation and creativity will be critical to success in free-to-play gaming, where it really hasn't been in the past. We need to evolve or drown in a sea of clones and rising costs. According to app data, there are over 16,000 apps on Facebook. Thousands of those are games. Plenty of them are good games, but that's not enough. Right? They just keep showing up, and the only major innovations, if any, tend to be in the theme, not gameplay, or social mechanics. But enough of that. On to the interesting design decisions, data, and lessons learned throughout development. Okay, lesson number one. In social games, you have roughly five seconds to capture someone's attention. And after you have their attention, it only takes five seconds to lose it. The average attention span today is roughly five seconds long. 10 years ago, it was 12 minutes. And this is according to research. There's so many things competing for our attention today that it's actually changed our brain structures. Our brains are essentially prediction engines, and now they're expecting tweets and status updates and emails and texts and lolcats so often that if we don't engage our players' minds for five seconds, they're likely to wander off and forget that we exist. Especially so for Facebook games, because you're on your computer with so many other things to do. And on top of that, Players are playing these games with the intention of investing smaller amounts of time. So to address this, we compressed the minute-to-minute -minute gameplay of The Sims 3 into second-to-second -second gameplay in The Sims Social. 
Most interactions in The Sims Social only take a few seconds. Initially, when we were first building the game, they were much longer, but they just felt too long. One of the longest interactions we have right now is sleeping in the bed. That's about 15 seconds at the most. Way too long all by itself. So what we make sure to do is that about every five seconds, a mood icon reward pops out and it's those little green smileys there. We do this so that you feel satisfied that something is happening and it gives you something to interact with while you wait for your sim to finish the interaction. So you have to ask yourself, are your load times longer than five seconds? If so, you're losing players, unless you have rotating visuals or text on the screen to engage them. But even then, that only works for a little while. Does it take your character longer than five seconds to get from point A to point B? Speed it up. Players will forgive inhumanly quick route speeds and little animation skating, but what they won't forgive is you wasting their time. We've had to actually increase our walk speed of The Sims twice so far. And even then, I still don't think our Sims move quickly enough all the time. We also launched with a ninja character trait, which speeds up your sim and sometimes teleports them instantly. And this helps solve the problem without totally breaking the fiction. It's the most popular character trait that we have, right next to the Great Kisser trait. And you have to ask, how spaced are your rewards? Okay, lesson number two. Simplicity is key in social games, especially with your interface. Because when your player has not paid for your game yet, and they've just started out, they've absolutely nothing invested in it. That means they will have no problem walking away at the slightest point of friction. If your game seems too complicated or like it will take effort to figure out, you will lose players. Your game must be simple and easy to grasp on the surface with a clean interface and clear concepts, and only hint at depth. Depth that players will uncover and that will keep them engaged as they begin to explore your game. And you can do this by boxing up your content, your UI, and your systems into bite-sized quanta, rather than giving it to players all at once in a tidal wave. Let's look at an example. Here are the social interaction menus from The Sims 3 and The Sims Social. This is what shows up when you click on another sim to interact with them. Do you notice the difference? The Sims Social has nearly as many social interactions as The Sims 3 does behind the scenes, yet we only show you six to eight at any given time. So what you're looking at here for The Sims 3 is actually already a submenu. This is the friendly submenu. The level above this had other options leading to other submenus like funny and mean and romantic and so on. And some menus also have a more option right there, which means there are multiple pages. So this actually looks more like that. And then some submenus also have submenus of their own, right? And this is constantly changing as you play. This works very well for our PC games, where players have more time to spend learning the system. Once you figure it out, it's great because you can have a very powerful storytelling experience since you're able to choose very specific options at any given time. But seeing this the first time is intimidating, and using it takes effort, and it often requires many clicks. And so it's not appropriate for the free-to-play space because it can scare players away and take too much time to use. And that's why you need to take deep content like this and box it up into bite-sized chunks. So in The Sims Social, we compartmentalize these interactions by hiding them behind a much smaller sliding window, which reacts to the flavor of interactions you're doing, and we cycle in new options to replace the ones that you've just chosen. This way, the player never has to cope with submenus or pages of options, but we still keep that depth of content. In a way, I like this limited window system better because it's also more exploratory and our players tell us they like finding new actions with their friends as they progress. Now, let's look at monetization and how that affects design. Lesson number three, metrics favor short-sighted decisions. And when I say metrics, I mean telemetry, the data that your game automatically collects about what your players are doing. Now, this isn't a problem if you're only focused on engagement, like in the paid space. But when microtransactions enter the equation, things begin to get tricky. And this is a struggle that I've dealt with repeatedly. Let me be clear, metrics are fantastic to have. You should definitely have them. But what I'm saying is that often they are taken at face value and interpreted in potentially destructive ways. Let's talk about this for a bit. But first, what the hell is a PM? Now, at the GDC, I asked people to raise their hands if they knew what a product manager is. And I was actually 
pleasantly surprised when about half the audience raised their hands. For me, I had no idea that product managers even existed before I joined Playfish. At Playfish, PMs are in charge of the business and the economy of your game. They paw through metrics and wrangle them to make suggestions for increasing monetization, virality, engagement, and retention. Now, PMs and designers, they sometimes butt heads because often their top goals conflict. Make money on the PM side versus fun on the design side. Every time you inject monetization into a feature, it becomes less fun. But you need both. And really, both PMs and designers want to make a great game that succeeds and profits. And to help do that, PMs give us awesome data like this. This is pasted directly from a PM presentation. Now, I don't want to make you stare at this, right? but it was showing us the drop-off rate of players for each quest in a series of five different quest chains. And it helped us realize that, hey, very few players are engaging in our weekly quests because certain requirements of having to either purchase items or needing to ask friends for help were too frequent or too difficult. So in response, what we were able to do is this past December, we made our quests easier. And the resulting community sentiment was summed up by our community leader as follows. It was amusing, fast, inexpensive, and with a beautiful and fun reward, the rocking reindeer. The majority of people prefer their limited quests fast and easy. Great, so more players completed the quests as shown by our data. Players had more fun, they told us so, but we made less money because fewer players paid to skip the objectives. So would you consider that a success or a failure? Do you stick with easy quests that more players engage in and enjoy, but then make less money? We'll never know unless we can measure how easy quests contribute to retention and the resulting ripples of that retention. So here's a hypothetical situation to help us wrap our heads around it. Let's pretend that if we had easy quests, players would play our game for an average of three months longer. So in this three months of extra play, what we need to know is, do the spenders spend enough to cover our losses from those quests? But it's not just as simple as that. You also have to ask, for all players, do they create enough viral and social activity that it then goes on to acquire new players who then spend to help cover our losses? But the thing is, we can't measure these things. There are too many variables changing too quickly, and it's a question asked over too long a period of time. By the time you've measured these things with an A-B test, your game, your players, and your audience have changed, and it's too late. But it's easy to make a graph that shows declining revenues and argue for tougher quests. And the thing is, we can't prove that's the wrong decision. We don't even know it's the wrong decision. It may be the right decision. And this is why, unless we're careful, we'll tend to make the short-sighted decision every time, which is more money right now. Raf Koster sums this up nicely when he says, Metrics help you find the local maxima, not the highest point in the possibility space. So what do you do then? There's no easy answer, and every game has different considerations. But if you know what your goals are for short-term revenue versus long-term revenue and retention, and you should have those goals, then you need to reflect on them and try to find a compromise based on intuition and how your current retention and revenue numbers are trending. By the way, on a side note, studies have found that if a player is fully engaged before they spend money, they end up spending 25% more in the long run. Think about that. And be careful when you decide to start blocking your players with monetized gates. Metrics also cannot measure fun. You can't measure why a feature is fun, or why anything for that matter. Metrics can't get inside a player's mind. We can't even really measure if a feature is fun. Data can show us, for example, that our players spend 36% of their energy engaging in skills, far more than any other singular feature. And that 40% purple area down there, that's just a combination of leftover stuff, not a singular feature. But this doesn't mean that skills are intrinsically fun, even though that's how some people would equate this. Players may only engage in skills because they need to earn money and they're willing to put up with them. Which brings us to the next lesson. 
If you want to understand a feature qualitatively or emotionally, you need to ask your players. You have their email addresses. Ask them to take surveys and reward them for it. It's really easy. We sometimes get tens of thousands of responses. When asked, players rated skills as the second most fun of our major features. Great. Verified. So they do like skills, which is good because it's a major facet of our core loop. Survey data affects our trajectory in many ways too. So here's an example. Before launch, we had this long list of post-launch features all prioritized and ready for the design production pipeline. And then we release. And we ask our players, what are your largest points of pain when you're playing the game? Top answer, 69% of players said, I am running out of space for my things. Alarm bells go off because once they run out of space, it's essentially an end game scenario. They stop purchasing objects and they may stop playing altogether. So our new top priority became a way to expand your land. And that was the first major feature we released post launch. Now here's a quote I love. A plan is just a list of things that don't happen. And that's so true when transitioning from closed beta to live. Your plans will often change drastically once you see how players really engage with your game. Having closed betas helps, but it's never a full indicator of what you learn when your game is out there in the wild. Now let's move on to a different sort of data, the kind of data that players use to gauge their progress against each other. Social games often rank players to create competition. Most commonly, they rank by player level. And this is an example here where the highest level players are on the right. This is typically indicated by a star and your level number, as shown here. And usually each action in the game that costs energy will drop experience points. And those experience points contribute to the level. And so a player's level is really just an indicator of how much you've played. It's like a seniority. And nobody ever told me this, so I don't know if it's prevailing knowledge, but I'm telling you now because plenty of games haven't caught on. Player level does nothing to motivate engagement in your core loop. It's a passive metric. Instead of ranking players by level, find a core mechanic that can choose to play toward. It will create stronger competition and drive spending. We rank our players by house value because as designers, we wanted decorations to do more than just sit around and look pretty. They should tie into a system, especially when the majority of your objects are decorations. Houses like this, the player should be rewarded for making houses this awesome. Here's how it works. Every item in the store has some house value rating on it, right there. You buy the item, you place it, and this house value loot pops out which then flies to the meter in the, the upper left of the screen there, which is ever-present, beckoning for you to fill it. And at certain milestones, you get a new street and sidewalk outside your home. The fiction is that you've moved into a new neighborhood. In the beginning, you start in the dumps, but it quickly begins to look nicer and nicer. And our cash items give extra house value. This, in turn, motivates spending. And this is a great example of how design and monetization should go hand in hand. We wanted a fun and motivating system, but we also wanted to pay the bills. And it's also worth noting that stored items, all that stuff you shove in your inventory, still count towards home value, which encourages creativity in your home designs rather than min-maxing and cramming a bunch of stuff in the corner of your lot. Now, when we asked players why they spent money, real hard cash on house objects, this was their number one answer because the item increased my house value. And this is a huge deal. This is a big source of revenue. If instead we'd rank by player level, then the game would be less fun and we'd be making less money. Here's an interesting side effect though. So we have this one contingent of players who absolutely loves to spend money on new clothing for their characters. However, there's also another contingent of players who are so competitively focused on raising their home value that they never purchase new clothing for their characters because it doesn't increase the home value. So you have to be careful what you leave in and out of these loops. For us, it would actually probably make sense to now go back and start giving you home value with clothing, even though that's a bit of a fictional stretch. Okay, so here's what makes a strong ranking system. More granularity. It lets players pass each other more often and creates healthy competition. No cap. You don't want your best players bunched up around the top like you get with a level cap. 
tie it to your core gameplay. And it should be a mechanic that the player can opt to play toward. You want them to have agency so that it will drive monetization. A good example besides the Sim Social is Castleville, which gives you castle points for building more castle pieces. So if you don't have a suitable metric that fits these categories, design one. Here's a good lesson while we're talking about purchases, and it can be applied to any game with microtransactions. Give players lasting value with their purchases. We asked our first time purchasers how likely they were to make another purchase after buying the things you see here. Now this is a very important question because converting players from first time spenders to repeat spenders is one of our biggest hurdles. These items are ranked from the highest likelihood to repurchase at the top there with clothing and appliances, all the way down to the items they're least likely to repurchase with quest skipping and help building rooms and objects. And players who bought the items at the top of the list felt more positive about their purchase. And those who bought the stuff from the bottom of the list felt less positive. And there's a very clear trend here. Everything at the top of the list, except for one, is a permanent item. You get it. It lasts forever. And everything at the bottom of the list is transient. You click a purchase button, you move forward a little in an endless march of progress, and you have nothing of lasting value to show for it. And it tends to give players a case of buyer's remorse. By the way, these transient purchases are also the best revenue generators for us, thanks to our repeat spenders. So it's really important that players are happy with these purchases, especially the first time spenders, because we want to convert them to repeat spenders. So here's my design suggestion to those of you who let players pay to buy energy, skip quests, or otherwise make a transient purchase. Find a way to add permanent value to those purchases. For example, the first time a player buys energy, give them a unique item along with it, something they can't get anywhere else, and have subsequent purchases make progress towards earning other exclusive items. Now, there are plenty of possibilities. The SimSocial hasn't tried anything like this yet, but now that we have this data, we'd certainly like to. And you should too, because it would strengthen the economy and players would be happier about it. While we're on the subject of value and purchases, here's my first bold claim of the day. Our highest grossing players only spend as little as they do, because we don't make it easy or rewarding enough for them to spend more. We're leaving money on the table. First of all, I'm not saying that we should raise our standard prices. We shouldn't. We already charge enough. But the thing is, we're not catering to our top tier in the right way. We need to address them separately from our normal audience. And by top tier, I mean the very small fraction of a percent of spenders at the very top. People like this, who love money, have plenty of it, and love to spend it. When those players pick up our games, it's like a multimillionaire walking into a casino that only has penny slots. To have real fun, that multimillionaire wants to sit at a high stakes table and slap down a fat wad of cash. There's a small but very real audience out there that wants to pay a lot for exclusive items that separate them from the pack. Just a few months ago, a man in China paid $16,000 for a unique sword for an MMO called Age of Wulin. A few other items in the auction also went for thousands. And by the way, this game? It wasn't even out yet. If you have a large enough audience, you have a handful of spenders that would prefer to be super spenders if only we would let them. Another benefit of these special items is that they generate buzz about your game, and then they become lore and story for your community. The only reason I knew about Age of Wulin was because this was newsworthy and someone sent around an article. This can and should be more than a few one-off items. We can set up an entire structure to harness super spender power, and we can do it in a way that doesn't sideline or aggravate the average spender. I can't get into specifics now, but I hope to one day have data to share. This next lesson relates to creativity. We all love to give our players choices, it makes them feel creative, and it adds depth to your game. And in fact, without choices, you can barely even have a game. But you should avoid giving your players strict choices early on. There's a different kind of choice, fuzzy choice, which works better. And what does this mean? Strict choices are ones that tend to feel high stakes and limited. Take the red pill or the blue pill. 
You have to pick one, and you have to pick it right now. Before players understand your game, these choices can make them feel uncomfortable and cause them to leave. Fuzzy choices are the ones that feel open-ended, relaxed, and creative. Here's a pill. Paint it whatever color you want. In most cases, players wouldn't think about painting something as making a choice, even though the possibility space is many times higher than with strict choices. And here's an example of how strict choice can be a problem. What you see here was the original entry point to the Sim Social. You won't find it anywhere in the game that we launched. We cut it, and here's why. It would load you up into a park with a bunch of random Sims walking around, and your instruction was, choose a Sim. You could use the arrows to swap to new randomized groups, and after you picked a Sim, we drop you into create a Sim where you can then customize to your heart's content. And players overwhelmingly hated this in tests. They said things like, what, are there only six Sims here? What if I pick the one my friend picks? I want to look different. But I don't want any of these. This is a stressful decision, right? Players don't know anything about the game yet, and they're being told to pick one of these characters. It's a choice that feels like it has consequences. Even if we tried to explain more by saying, don't worry, you'll be able to customize your sim, then they'd have more questions, like, how much will I be able to customize my sim? How does my choice here affect that outcome? Games aren't supposed to be stressful. Some of those players would have quit to go watch funny videos of Maru the Cat sliding around in boxes. A better approach is to eliminate this strict choice altogether and only give players the fuzzy choice of create a sim where everything feels open-ended and relaxed. That's what we ended up launching with. A strict choice is great to have, but later in the game, once players are more invested and feel more secure in their own knowledge of the mechanics and can trust themselves to make the right decisions. Now we're going to shift gears away from discrete lessons and talk about a more squishy and emotional subject. Relationships and character interaction. The really exciting stuff. Relationships are the biggest innovation that SimSocial brings to the social space. And in my opinion, it's the most powerful feature we have. So it's worth really digging into it and seeing some of the interesting ways that players interact. In most social games, you develop an implicit relationship with your friends based on how you play with them. And that doesn't really develop, and games don't acknowledge it. You ask for help, and you get help. Maybe you compare scores on leaderboards. But that's about it, which is a huge chasm of potential waiting to be filled. One character in a game is lonely. Two characters are suddenly ten times better because you can have a relationship, which casts a new dimension of interaction across all your gameplay. And three characters are better still because now there's an opportunity for choice and conflict, and lets players experience better stories. Or tell better stories if you give them control, like in the Fable series. In games, multiple characters are great. Especially when your friends are those other characters. The Sim Social takes advantage of this by making relationships real and building gameplay around them, creating shared goals between players. Not only is this fun, but it multiplies gameplay because it turns each one of your friends into a new goal with its own systemic progression. And that progression can react to you in a meaningful way because there's another human behind it, even when it's asynchronous. This interaction moves beyond the standard of just clicking on objects at your friends' places to collect a simple reward. We took the binary state of either being neighbors or not neighbors and turned it into a multi-dimensional web of 23 states, each one with new social interactions. This means you can potentially have 23 neighbors, each in a different relationship state, each with different gameplay at any given time. Now, for those of you who haven't seen it or played it yet, I've got a video clip here that demonstrates how this works. So, picked a nice action, the Sims will go over and chatter back and forth. But now if I go and I pick a Romantic option, the only the only one there, the flirt. Marty, ah. That will start to build momentum in the flirty direction, in the romantic direction. And now more romantic options will show up. Now there's two. And if you keep doing this, you'll eventually reach a new relationship level, as depicted by that bar at the top of the screen that pops down. On the right side is a more positive relationship state, and on the left side is a more negative relationship state. And 
Something to notice is that when you do mean interactions, the other sim will act upset. See, she's really upset. But then, right after, she goes back to smiling, and they're both happy again. And that's that's really important. We're going to talk about that in a sec. Now, there's something else you can do, which is you can, you can click on objects around the house. Certain ones have paired interactions on them that you can do together. Like, you can dance at the stereo together. You can massage each other on couches. You can hang out in a hot tub. Players love these items. It's some of our best-selling items. And then you can go and some of these interactions let you share with the other player that you've done these things with them. All right, great. So, back to this. See how the sim looks happy even though I'd just been insulting her and I didn't even apologize? This is important to note. It's not an oversight. It's on purpose. Being mean is not a truly evil act in the sim social. The majority of players want to be nice to each other in the social, casual space. So we made the mean relationships more of a funny rivalry. And the last thing you want is players logging in to find their creations and characters have become a smoking pile of rubble. Unless perhaps your entire game is built around destroying your friends' things like in Monster Mind. This is my beautiful town. But even then, this is going to turn away a lot of players and capture a more niche audience. So you have to understand what you're going for. So we make mean interactions rewarding for both parties. This picture here, this is one sim reacting to a fake spider the other sim put on the toilet. It's not creepy or destructive, but it's lighthearted and funny. Everything in the sim social is in good fun, whether you're being on someone's bushes or implying their mother is a llama. Still, some players are naturally hesitant to try out mean content. So you need to design motivators to push players to try it out. We use quests to encourage exploring friendly, mean, and romantic relationships. And the three flavors of social interaction each have their own collectible that you need for various skills and projects. We also drop a social currency to motivate all social interaction, which you can then use to purchase unique social items from the shop, like double beds and hot tubs, the items that you can use with other players. So it's a self-reinforcing gameplay loop. And because we've added all this extra social gameplay, the natural next step was to let you spend as much energy as you want at your friend's place. Instead of just getting a set amount per day per visit, which is the current standard, you get a bonus, but then can freely spend the rest of your energy as well. I believe this is where energy-based games will go once stronger social mechanics take hold and become commonplace. It's just a natural evolution. This is Castleville. It's a fantastic game. The art style is gorgeous. It's got a huge audience. The exploration is fun. And you can build some really cool looking castles. And just look at all the stuff on the screen to interact with when you're visiting your friend's place. Just look at it. It's incredible. You can click on just about anything when you're visiting your friend. Except for your friend themselves. Now, I'm using Castleville as an example because it's a top game and they can take it. But this is a gaping hole in many games where you can walk right up to the other player's character and they can stare right through you. Sometimes I feel like a ghost, calmly wandering around, touching my friend's things, so they might be able to get the message that I still exist. Here's a crazy theory I have. I believe that forging relationships in the game can bring players closer in real life, and it relates to cognitive dissonance theory. I'm not going to read all this, but the gist of it is that if our brains are holding conflicting beliefs or emotions about something, our brains will try to resolve them in some way, possibly by shifting closer to one of those beliefs. In other words, if someone you're connected with on Facebook becomes your neighbor in the sim social, and if in real life you're really just light acquaintances, then your avatars, your sims, if they become best friends with each other, you may begin to feel closer to each other in reality because you're projecting yourselves into your sims. And if they are such good friends, shouldn't you be in real life too? Or at the very least, shouldn't you be a bit more friendly around each other the next time you cross paths in the office kitchen or bump into each other at the coffee machine? In a way, 
Relationships in The SimSocial are a lens through which players can explore and play with their real-life relationships. And as the game affects your real-life thoughts and beliefs about each other, it increases your engagement as well, in a cycle that becomes a bit of a self-fulfilling prophecy. This isn't powerful for everyone, but it at least has a subtle effect on our subconscious. Which brings me to romance. This is by far the most intriguing aspect of gameplay because it connects with us on a deeper level, although it comes with some consequences. Romances are exclusive. We wanted players making meaningful choices here. And we make sure to always have your status visible, always there in the bottom left of the HUD, right there. And when you're at your friend's place, theirs is visible as well on the right. Because we want to remind you that while your sim is getting a flirty massage from another sim, that you are single, and this is an opportunity for you. If only that other sim weren't already tied into a relationship. And we do let you hover over that icon to see who that other player is, if they're a mutual Facebook friend. And if they are a mutual Facebook friend, this creates an opportunity to gossip outside of the game. And you want your players to do just that. Now, if the other sim is single, you still both have to agree that you want to be in a relationship. Here's an example of a dating request that I sent to my coworker, Veronica. Notice how, although it has pictures of our sims and the label dating, it also has pictures of us. This is part of what contributes to cognitive dissonance that can bring people closer in real life. If we're dating in a game, I mean, if our sims are dating, then our subconscious may try to reconcile that gap, even if just a little. I actually felt like I had to ask Veronica's permission in real life before I sent this request, which I wouldn't have felt the need to do for someone I was closer with in real life already. There's an unspoken social protocol at work here. Now, if there's someone you want to date who's already in a relationship, you can also ask that person to break up so that they can date you. This adds a real social conflict that extends beyond the confines of your PC screen. Let's look at how this can affect people. Here's a personal experience from AJ Glasser that she posted in an article on Inside Social Games. She asked her friend to break up, but her friend responded, I totally would accept your request, but my fiance would kill me. One of the unspoken rules of the social protocol is that if you and your significant other both play, then you cannot date other sims. You must date each other. And roughly 50% of players adhere to this protocol. I started a thread on the forums to investigate this, and it quickly got over a thousand views and pages of replies. Let's look at a few. This lady says, I would never, ever feel comfortable with my boyfriend dating a different girl's sim, nor would I date another guy's sim. And this girl says, my college friend dated my sim. This freaked my boyfriend out. I then dated my girlfriend for a while, and of course my boyfriend didn't care then. Quite a few players make sims for their significant others, or better yet, convince them to start playing. And they do this specifically because they need someone to fill that role of the exclusive relationship. Preferably, someone they can peer pressure daily to play and fulfill their sim's needs. And trust me, this is a great force to have going for your game. I recommend it. Any kind of in-game exclusive relationship will do to get this kind of peer pressure going. It does not have to be romance. You could be, for example, exclusive adventure allies in a safari game. Even though consistency with real life relationships is the sentiment of half the players, the others are fine outside these bounds. Those players commonly justify it by saying, it's only a game, like this person here. What's interesting is, the only time you hear the stricter side stating, it's just a game, it's usually worded, I know it's just a game, but that's totally unacceptable and you're a scumbag if you do it. Though they sometimes make an exception if their spouse won't play enough to fulfill their needs. For example, if a husband and wife are playing and the wife logs in twice as much, it's okay for her to then find another female sim for her sim to date. The husband can't get jealous of that. This is a good time to mention that our audience is 70% female. There just aren't enough good men to go around. 
And this is what happens. This screenshot is from our forums and is one of only many, many pages of female players looking for sim boyfriends. And some of these threads have hundreds of views. So for those of you guys out there, if you're looking to meet a nice girl over a social game, this is your place. But this can be a problem, right? So on the one hand, it generates a lot of talk outside the game. It creates a lot of new friendships and it strengthens the community. But it makes romances harder for a lot of female players. When there's this much talk about any one thing within your community, you probably want to consider making a change. So looking at this, my response is, how can we channel this into a game feature, but without destroying all this great momentum? So I'm wondering why not let Sims use online dating over their computers to connect with other players of similar needs? I think that would be an incredibly strong social feature that would help push the boundaries of social into the next gen. And we're not actually working on this right now. It's just what I would do if I could materialize features at will and put them right into the game with my mind. It would be a great feature. The Sims, by the way, doesn't distinguish between same sex or opposite sex couples. It's all allowed. The players tend to want to play in line with their own sexual orientation. So that doesn't really help the gender imbalance. Now let's talk about sex. We call it woohoo to keep with the lighthearted nature of the Sims. And it's cartoony. The Sims kiss for a while, then disappear under the covers and the bed bounces around. And players love it. Sims woohoo nearly 700,000 times a day. They can woohoo in beds, showers, hot tubs, igloos, tents, natural springs, and so on. We get constant requests to let Sims woohoo in new places. It gives players an aspect of real life that they don't get in other games, and it allows them to tell more interesting stories with each other. And just so that you can see what all the rage is about, I've got a video here that I think you'll enjoy. Okay, now I'm going to start by flirting. Samba two. And As a llama she does day. not seem to be into that suggestion. But I want her to accept a flirt, so she's more likely to accept the woohoo. <laughs> Lord Glee. All right, I'm in. So now I can click on the bed and choose woohoo, and she'll accept. Dude sprints over there. And they hop in bed and do their thing. And this interaction, by the way, this lasts longer than five seconds without an intermediate reward. And players are fine with it. Because the interaction is the reward itself. And you get an option to share with the world. And then you also get an option to share specifically with the other player. And that's what that little double heart tip that popped up in the lower right arm is. Great. So that's Boohoo. So you saw in the video that you get a chance to share that you've woohooed, and it's perhaps the strongest wall post we have. In a presentation that Facebook gave on best practices, they pointed to this as the prime example of something meaningful to post from your game. Because ultimately, you're not trying to just get your game on someone's wall. What you are trying to do is you're trying to get the player to write something interesting along with their post, because that's where the true value exists for their friends. We need to start choosing only the best things to share, not just because it's the courteous thing to do, but because posts are becoming harder to use as a viral mechanism. In a study of 750,000 referrals, we found that 93% of them came from the now defunct ticker up in the corner of Facebook. Only 7% came from the feed and the timeline combined, a minor amount. Yet at three months old, this data is ancient and unreliable. And Facebook says the ticker wasn't a high source of traffic. They probably meant for new games, not sure. Either way, they killed it and they're constantly changing. But we can still take a lesson from this. It's the players are tuning out the mass quantities of feed posts or just can't find them. All those level ups and quest completes and I just collected a red gum wrapper nobody cares posts are getting in the way of finding the ones that are truly moving. Ultimately, it's going to change from a competition for eyeballs by spamming Facebook walls, to a competition for interest, by only choosing posts that are meaningful and effective. What I've learned is that we want to see drama between players. We want to see amazing creations. We want to hear what's really on players' minds when they're making these posts. Now back to WooHoo. These posts are about drama 
and they create drama, though not always in a totally positive, comfortable way. Some of that uncomfortableness either comes from disobeying the tacit social protocols of gaming relationships, or creating cognitive dissonance for others based on your actions, which may have overstepped those boundaries. Here's one example I came across. It starts innocently enough. Female player posts, I just woohooed with male player's sim. And then male player responds happily, hooray, we won the game. And this is all taking place on Facebook, by the way. But then the husband of the female player pops onto the thread and he says, at male player, this is the husband here. Can I please have your wife's Facebook info? I'd like to play a game of the sim social with her. Smiley. Male player replies, eh, never had these dilemmas playing Farmville. And then the husband says, yeah, you've never scored a home run with anyone's wife in Farmville. Frowny face. Then don't intentionally create negative drama. But if you have some good social mechanics, some uncomfortable drama will be unavoidable. It means you're coming closer and closer to real human interaction. Whether players are arguing over a word you played in Words with Friends, or complaining about some exam questions you made up for them in a university game. If something like this happens from time to time, you are on the right track. Now, all this drama and relationships and exclusivity and so on creates a lot of chatter outside the game. You want to give your players all the reasons you can to talk about your game and gossip with each other when they aren't playing it. Forget Facebook channels. This is the best viral marketing. Everybody started playing Minecraft because nobody would shut the hell up about it. Spamming Facebook channels is a crutch, not a solution. Design this stuff into your game. What can you give your players so they won't shut up about it when they're away from the keyboard? Now, coming back to relationships, I have to ask, as a broader space, why aren't we doing more of this? Why aren't we emphasizing our relationships and encouraging players to develop them? The stronger the bond your players have, the more invested they will be, and the longer they will play. We have the pieces, we're just not using them. We've got the players, so we should be rewarding them for interacting with each other on a prolonged basis. Let's give them incentive to build towards something meaningful with each other. I was happy to see that after three years, Yovil added a light form of relationships. And as I was polishing my slides, Digital Chocolate released New in Town, which also lets you have some limited relationships with friends. But you don't need Sims or even avatars to do this. Farms can have relationships. How much have I tended your crops? How often do you drop manure on my barn doorstep? If we get a relationship really high, maybe we can unlock new ways to help each other out. Or perhaps I can harvest more for you when I visit. Cities can have relationships. They certainly do in real life, whether they're helping each other out with trade or writing about rival sports teams. Or the players themselves can have relationships. Like I said, to a degree, that's how our Sims players interpret relationships between their characters anyway. Any form of relationship that gives players meaningful goals with each other will raise retention. And it doesn't matter what game you're playing. Even words with friends could label your relationship based on how many games you've had with each other, or your balance of wins and losses, and then evolve gameplay based on that. Now, I've talked up relationships a lot, but they're not perfect in the sim social. If you've played, chances are that you've had a lot of fun with relationships for a while, but for some of you, you weren't engaged over the long term. Here are a few things I'd improve. The progression is too quick. Players can hit the end of relationship in two weeks. We need more states. We need to make sure that the last ones take months to progress through. There are also no large strategic motivators. There's nothing I can bring back to my home life because you and I are best friends. You have nothing unique to offer me compared to anyone else. We need to solve that problem. And we need an overarching goal structure that gives players a reason to have deeper relationships with all of their friends. And finally, I may think this is one of the most social features in social gaming today, but it still isn't social enough. We could let players live together at high relationship levels. We could let them get married. And when they do, choose friends to officiate. 
We could give players public spaces to start clubs, strengthened by good relationships. Or we could do simple things like letting you hang pictures of your sim's significant other on your walls. These are all solvable problems, and there are plenty of possibilities. Really, I believe this is only the birth of relationships in social gaming. So I'm going to wrap up this part of the discussion with a bold claim. And here it is. Relationships are going to be one of the next big trends in social games. Hopefully I've convinced you of their utility and their potential. Now we just have to see when the rest of the space catches on. Now I want to take a few minutes to divine what the future may have in store for social gaming. First, the quality bar will continue to rise, with more beautiful art and higher fidelity animations and sound. I point to The Sim Social, Castleville, and Galaxy Life as examples of the current bar. But we'll also see high quality core games free to play with social mechanics. Studios like Rumble Games and Euphoria are already building them. And these will start appearing very soon. This screenshot is from Draken Song Online. It's a 3D Diablo esque game. It's not on Facebook, but is a free to play web game that uses Facebook Connect. And this is indicative of what we'll soon see directly on Facebook. But what about the more casual space? Where is that going? If I find a social game that I like and I invite someone to play, I usually say, hey, this is fun, you should play too. But it feels wrong to say, let's play together. That phrase makes sense with poker and scramble with friends, but our most successful games aren't there yet because we're just scratching the surface of social interaction. Players want community and they want togetherness. And this is where the brightest future of social gaming lies. We'll see higher adoption of synchronous play to complement the asynchronous play. Asynchronous play will always be important. Now, some games do this already. It's what players want. Many of our sim social players, they say this is what they had expected out of a sim social, but were disappointed when we didn't have it. We'll also have more relationships of all kinds in games, and they'll have worthwhile meaning. We'll see shared spaces where players can live and play together. And along with that, we'll see more games with public spaces where characters can meet each other. So the game doesn't end when your friends stop playing, because you can then easily go and find new people to play with. In a prospective player survey about social mechanics, meeting other players was the second most popular social feature request. And 36% of players in social gaming already say they play with strangers. But most of those people have to find each other on forums or Facebook groups outside of the game. Let's make it easier. But let me stress that it has to be safe and friendly. If you can go right up to someone and say whatever you want to them in a social casual space, that is scary. We need to work on this. And once we can play together, we'll see group goals, things we can work toward as a community. Co-op farming in Farmville is just a small start. And we'll want to enable self-forming organizations like clubs and guilds to strengthen this community. We'll see better creativity tools. In games about decoration, they need to be a central feature. Games that cultivate this will win. And then we'll see systems for sharing these creations with everyone and for surfacing the best ones and categorizing them. For example, if you make this awesome ice fort in the Sim Social, everyone should be able to see it and upvote it. By the way, Restaurant City, try this rating system based on stars. But stars are bad in the casual space because then you can explicitly tell someone that what they made sucks, right? Like you, zero stars, you suck. You don't want that. Pure upvotes are better. Another mistake we also made with Restaurant City was that we rewarded players for ranking others, which takes the intrinsic reward out of the system, making it meaningless. So don't do that either. Pure upvotes are better. So maybe you can tour anyone's farm and give it an upvote if you like it, and then see the best ones on leaderboards and visit those. Perhaps you can search for the most popular, say, I don't know, what do you like? Sheep farms? and then go visit those. And we'll see rewards for being recognized by the community, like elite objects and so on, that will help make you even more of a spectacle. 
because we want to make a spectacle of our players. We want to make it easy for the best players to draw lots of attention, to become idols, and to create followings. Now, what all this amounts to is a breaking down of social barriers. Imagine YouTube if you could only see what your friends had recorded. Imagine Twitter if you could only follow people that agreed to follow you, too. Imagine all the worldwide charity programs where you could only help people you were already acquainted with. We need to go further than that. This is just a taste of where I believe the social space is going. Now I'd like to close with one final bold claim, and here it is. The world of Warcraft of the social space hasn't arrived yet, but soon it will. Now, I'm not talking about genre or specific game design. I'm talking about size and retention of audience. The most successful social game, Cityville, had just over 100 million monthly players at peak. Facebook has over 800 million users and is still growing aggressively. So I think we can do better. And here's the analogy that I like to make. In 2004, when MMOs were a few years into success, they were a hot topic much like social games are now. In the US, we looked at EverQuest as the current bar. It had hundreds of thousands of subscriptions. Maybe we looked at RuneScape in Asia with a few million. That's where I think we are now with social games. So that was EverQuest. And then WoW comes along and obliterates that high bar with 12 million subscribers and rewrites our understanding of what makes a compelling MMO experience, not the least of which was accessibility, particularly to non-masochists. And we're still here. And this is the unexplored promised land that awaits us. Vastly larger audiences who stay engaged far longer and spend more money. And it's worth pointing out that one of EverQuest's faults was that it scared people into being social. Wander around alone and you will die and will probably never get back to your corpse again. World of Warcraft, on the other hand, made it first and foremost a fun and friendly place for solo players. But it was so fun and friendly, in fact, that it's a place you wanted to be with your friends. And so you brought your friends there, and you made friends there, and then you could go on even grander adventures together, and the rest is history. Maybe you hear me saying this and you think that I still don't understand the social gaming space. And there's a hint of truth to that. In fact, I think none of us really understand the social game space entirely yet. We found some patterns that work, and hell, they pay out big, but we're clinging onto them to a fault. But soon, we're going to let go of that and begin to find true social interaction. And it's going to come hand in hand with true understanding of the social space and with greater success. The next few years will be transformative. We are going to witness incredible change. Which ones of you will be the ones who take us there? Thank you. Thank you for listening, everyone. Um, feel free to email me or send me questions or tackle me if you see me at the next GDC. I'm actually quite friendly. Thanks very much for listening. Here's my info. Feel free to contact me or follow me on Twitter. Check out my blog. And the slides are available for download on my website um, in multiple formats. All right. Thanks again. Take care.